to the fifth International Ministerial Conference on Nuclear Power in the 21st century. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that simultaneous interpretation will be provided in Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish during the conference sessions. In focus events will be held in English only, except for the in focus event on Together for More Women in Nuclear. To facilitate the interpretation of national statements, I kindly ask that you provide the text of your statement to the conference services desk located in front of the plenary hall at your earliest convenience and in advance of the delivery. Please note that the final program is available on the IAEA app as well as on the IAEA website. Thank you. We can now begin our opening session. Please take the reactor to full power. I understand you want me to withdraw control rods to bring the reactor to full power. That's correct. Withdrawing control rods. I now invite the Secretary of Energy of the United States of America, Jennifer Granholm, IAEA Director General Rafael Mariano Grossi, and OECD NEA Director General William Magwood IV to take their places at the dais. I'm pleased to give the floor to the President of the conference, Her Excellency Ms. Jennifer Granholm, Secretary of Energy of the United States of America. Uh, Madam President, you, now, you may now call the meeting to order and open the conference. Thank you, Dohi. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to Washington, D.C. On behalf of the United States of America, it's my privilege to officially call this meeting into order and open the conference. The United States is honored to join the countries selected to host this very important meeting and delighted to serve as the very first host in the Americas. These next three days will be busy 
but I hope you will have some time to visit the museums or the monuments or the other sites of our fair city. Let me thank Director General Grossi and the Secretariat staff for their great collaboration over the past two and a half years and all that time has entailed to bring us together today. And let me also acknowledge the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's Nuclear Energy Agency for their help in organizing this event, as well as the International Energy Agency. We are so pleased to have the IEA on the organizing team for the first time, and I'm delighted to know that Executive Director Birol will be participating as well. The IAEA Secretariat has developed an expansive conference program to build on the several important recent dialogues on nuclear power's role in the global energy mix. At the 10th review conference of the parties uh, to the Treaty on Nonproliferation of Nuclear Weapons this past August in New York, the international community referenced and reinforced the fundamental legal framework underpinning peaceful expansion of nuclear technologies worldwide. And then the Global Clean Energy Action Forum, which I hosted in Pittsburgh last month, highlighted nuclear power's utility in the face of global climate and energy security crises. And then last month, we gathered in Vienna for the first fully in-person IAEA General Conference since 2019, where we advanced initiatives on nuclear safety, security, and safeguards to support peaceful uses of the atom. And the U.S. government is eager to forge ahead on all of these matters. We see enormous potential in nuclear power to advance our climate goals, to enhance our energy security, to widen affordable energy access, to create millions of high quality, good paying jobs. And that's why the Biden-Harris administration is investing in both the continued operations of our own world leading nuclear fleet and in the generation of the next nuclear reactors, while at the same time that we are rem remain committed, obviously, to high standards of safety and security and nonproliferation. All of these efforts will depend on bringing a new generation of nuclear experts into the field and deepening the pool of skilled workers that are prepared to help deploy these advanced nuclear technologies. And so to that end, the Secretariat has organized an event tomorrow evening that's dedicated to inspiring young people to pursue careers in nuclear power and, uh, and imagining new ways of conveying nuclear energy's benefits. And then on Friday afternoon, I'll uh, join Director General Grossi for a conversation on how we can encourage more women to join the nuclear workforce. I hope you'll attend both of those events. And of course, even as we gather to discuss the promising future of nuclear power, we, have, we cannot lose sight of the grave challenges of our present. So I'd like to take a moment to convey our deep appreciation to Director General Grossi for his leadership throughout all too many long days and sleepless nights amid the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. I believe that I speak, DG Grossi, for everyone here in saluting the courage and the dedication of the IAEA staff who've established a presence at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, their work to maintain the safety and security of the plant is a great service to the world and it's indispensable to the IAEA's founding vision of Atoms for Peace and Development. The United States remains committed as ever to that vision and to working alongside our fellow member states to make that vision our reality. Thank you so much, and it is my honor now to invite Mr. Rafael Mariano Grossi, Director General of the IAEA, to make to make a statement and address this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, 
And thank you very much, Madam Secretary, dear Jennifer, for having accepted uh, our invitation to host this important conference at a time which is really decisive at so many levels. Thank you very much for that and for your leadership. I will also like to thank my good friend, Bill Magwood, the Director General of the OECD NEA, uh, a sister organization with whom the IEA has been working for many, many years uh, to promote peaceful uses of nuclear energy all over the world, and also the association and cooperation of the International Energy Agency, the global think tank on energy matters, which has also been adding its uh, cooperation and assistance in putting together this important gathering. When um, I invited the United States to host this conference early on in my mandate, um, a couple of years ago, a little bit more, little did we know that we would be uh, holding this important event against the backdrop of war, uncertainty, anguish, anxiety, but also, also great hopes. And it is our duty to bring together all those, you and others in your countries, that can realize this imperative of the times, to bring the solutions in terms, as this film was showing, in terms of prosperity, in terms of growth, in terms of caring for the common house, our planet, through the beneficial uses of nuclear energy. So that was the invitation. That is the challenge. And this is what we are going to be discussing today and during the conference. But these things, of course, as we all know, do not happen spontaneously. Deliberate action, the right decisions, the political conviction are necessary to bring about the change and to bring about the necessary solutions from nuclear to the problems of the day. We know, and we are all confronted with that, we are faced with a number of converging crises. Some of them we knew, some of them took us completely by surprise. But of course, we cannot choose the conditions of the day. We have simply need to make the best out of them. So we all knew, we all knew that we are still facing a very, very serious problem in terms of climate change. And we know that the uh, tool bag that we have as humanity to confront this problem has a discrete number of solutions. There are not many, and we have to wisely choose those who are going to bring us where we want to be if we take seriously the commitments that our political leaders made in Paris and early on. And we all know, and it is not the Director General of the IAEA who says it, it is the world's brightest and most um, prestigious um, environmentalists and scientists who have um, agreed that without nuclear getting to zero, getting to decarbonation of our economies would simply be uh, impossible. So we know that and we have seen the change. The change is palpable. The change is seen in countries that were mature and confirmed users of nuclear energy like the United States that has been at the lead of the nuclear effort for so many decades. And it is also clear in other parts of the world, in China, in Asia, in India, in Russia, in Europe, where countries, important countries, at some point in their contemporary history thought that nuclear energy would no longer be part 
of their energy mix. And we see what we see, and we see countries reversing those decisions or decisively moving in to nuclear because we have to be led by science, by economically feasible decisions, and not by ideology. So this is what we see, but again, these things will not happen spontaneously. And we are going to need expansion because nuclear and the benefits of nuclear are not only for countries that already use them. Hardly a week passes without me listening to a Minister of Energy coming from Africa, from Latin America, from some parts in Asia who legitimately, legitimately say that they also want to benefit from the clean, reliable, dispatchable benefits of nuclear energy. And so we need to help them. We need to help them. And the IAEA, the Global House of Nuclear, is there to do that as well. You will be surprised to know that we are working with uh, no less than 19 African nations in their move towards nuclear. And we are working also in the continent I come from, Latin America, with the countries that are already using nuclear energy and want to pursue even more uh, this avenue. But this, of course, requires a number of things because even if convinced by the argument, we need to walk the walk. And walking the walk in nuclear means a number of things. Means important challenges on the financing of nuclear projects. And here we need and we will have to see adjustments that will have to go ranging from some uh, new policies and practices from international financing corporations that we are starting to see, but only now, after decades of stated policies of not encouraging, and I'm using diplomatic words here, uh, nuclear projects. But this is changing, and we welcome that, and this is important. And we are going to have to show opportunity uh, in nuclear by giving it as well a level playing field when necessary. Of course, coming from the IEA, safety and security of anything we do and ensuring that no, nothing, no project could contribute to the proliferation of nuclear weapons um, uh, is assured. And the IEA will be doing exactly that. We are going to be working with our member states and those who are encouraged to join the nuclear family to make sure that those things are done in the right way. As the Secretary uh, mentioned just now, uh, the issue of small and modular reactors is often mentioned. There are so many conference, symposia, gatherings, uh, meetings uh, about this. And this has been the case for a number of years. Let me tell you, I've been working on nuclear for almost 40 years. And even when I started the ideas about modularity and getting smaller uh, on, on nuclear reactors, we're already part of the discussion. The big difference is that now this is going to happen. Now we see projects being realized uh, in many parts of the world. We see contracts being signed. We see people working on this, but we have to do it, and we have to do it fast, and we have to do it safely. So for that to happen, we will also need to work with the regulatory, regulatory community, which works very closely with the IEA to make sure that just as technology evolves, just as politics evolve, just as technology moves forward, we will also need the normative structures that are commensurate and adapted and adjusted to the kinds of business models that we are having in this industry that is not an industry of the past. It is an industry of the future. So as you can see, dear friends, it is not only about talking promise, it is about bringing it to reality for everyone's benefit. Before closing, 
Madam Secretary, and you mentioned that, uh, a thought for those in need, a thought of those in many continents, and in particular uh, in Ukraine, who are suffering war. And here again, we need to prevent a major nuclear accident from happening. Tomorrow, I will be leaving you for just a few hours before I come back to go to the United Nations Security Council to plead again for the quick establishment of a protection zone around the Saporizhia uh, nuclear power plant. So, dear friends, promise, challenges, opportunities. It is up to us to do the right thing. And let the Washington Ministerial be remembered as the one that we, came, when we came together as one, facing the challenges of the day for everyone's benefit. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Director General Grossi, for that inspiring uh, statement. And now I have the honor of inviting uh, Mr. William D. Magwood, the fourth Director General of the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency, to address the conference. Thank you very much. Hey, good morning. Good morning, Secretary Granholm, Director General Grossi, friends, colleagues. It is truly an honor to be up on this dais today with all of you. After suffering through two years of COVID-19, to gather together once again to talk about important issues on this scale is something that I've been looking forward to for quite some time. Let me thank Secretary Granholm and her team, and Director General Grossi and the Secretary of the IEA for the hard work that went into pulling this conference together and for putting together such an impressive program. We meet at a very auspicious time. It was not long ago that the world met in Glasgow at COP26. And while there were many successes from COP26, particularly the seizing the opportunity to move from theory into action to deal with the climate crisis. Policymakers also came away from Glasgow somewhat sober. They found that the world was not on track to reach net zero by 2050. According to the UN IPCC, the global carbon budget, as we call it, will be exhausted in only eight years at current rates. When countries came back and looked at this reality, we found a buzzing conversation about nuclear energy. Some countries took very specific action. France announced the desire to build a whole new fleet of nuclear power plants. The UK accelerated their program. Many other countries launched into discussions about nuclear. At the NEA, we agree with the IEEA's conclusion that for electricity production, nuclear capacity has to double in order to help us meet our carbon reduction targets. But when you include the need to abate heat for industrial processes such as steelmaking, chemicals, fertilizer, and also the need to produce clean hydrogen at very large scales, NEA's analysis shows that overall, nuclear has to triple by 2050. So the target's even higher if we're going to be successful. So these discussions were, were boiling along. And then, of course, came the invasion of Ukraine. While the situation in Ukraine is indeed tragic, the ramifications for the world at large is something that I don't think any of us really anticipated the impact on commodities, the impact on energy, the impact on foreign relations overall, which is another conversation. But what we found in the aftermath of this event and the ongoing events is that the world came back to the most central issue of energy that has always been there, but perhaps has been forgotten in our comfort. The fact that our highest responsibility is to make sure that our people, our populations, our societies have access to reliable energy. 
that they have secure energy. And not just for wealthy countries in the OECD, but also for those countries who are growing and raising their people to a new level of living. They deserve the access to clean energy. And it's important to remember that we cannot ask our populations to make a choice between the energy and the environment. We have to do both. And that is where nuclear energy comes into the picture. We believe that we can, re we can triple the capacity of nuclear in both developed countries and the OECD and in rising economies around the world because new technologies are coming to the fore. Those new technologies are game changers. Along with our existing fleet of nuclear plants operating around the world safely and effectively, along with current technologies that are being built today, these new technologies give us the opportunity to spread this technology safely in the proliferation resistant way in all corners of the world to provide benefits to all people. I'm very excited by this possibility. And I congratulate the work of our host country, the US, United States of America, and particularly the Department of Energy under Secretary Granholm, and my friend Katie Huff, who is the Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy, and the work that they've done to solve many of the issues, or at least begin solving many of the issues associated with keeping plants operating for long term, and to deploy new technologies through the demonstration of advanced technology facilities. But challenges lie ahead, and those challenges are formidable. Industry has to succeed. The nuclear energy has had a long reputation of failure, long cost overruns, delays, failed projects. This cannot be the future. We have to change that picture. So And as Secretary Graham mentioned, we also have to deal with the human resources. It's one of the most frustrating aspects of what I do, is to see so many countries around the world struggling to find people to fill jobs in both regulatory organizations and industrial companies. People who are driven to think about the future. Because they don't think there's a future in nuclear. We have to change that. When I think about the work that we do in the nuclear sector, and many of you, not all of you, are members of this sector, I reflect on the fact that we inherently are people that believe in the future. We're futurists. We believe that the future is a really good place and that we can strive to do it. But we also have to recognize that the future doesn't happen by itself. We have to come together and we have to work. When it comes to human capacity, one issue that I think we all have to come together on is to make sure that women in all parts, in all countries, in all parts of the sector, have an equal opportunity to rise to leadership positions. Within the context of the OECD, we are working on that very hard. And just last week, the Steering Committee for Nuclear Energy agreed to a policy framework that doesn't just talk about this issue, but takes leadership and substantive change. We're going to be working towards having our member countries adopt this formally in the coming months. I think it's the most important thing that we've done over the last several years. So as I conclude, I just call on all of you to think about this in terms of not just the future of nuclear energy, it's much bigger than that. Because if we aren't successful in delivering, delivering these new technologies, it isn't a failure just for us, 
It's a failure of our societies to rise to the climate challenge and a failure of our generation to meet its responsibilities. So we have to look past what we've done in the past. We have to look past the failures and look to the future where we actually work together instead of against each other to succeed. Over the next few days, you will have substantive conversations on a wide range of issues. And I think that as you depart Washington and head back to your home countries, that you will have learned many things. But if you take one thing away, take this, that the only way we will succeed is if we work together. And if we fail to do that, then it is really our shame. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Magwood. Um, Mr. Fatih Baral, the executive director of the International Energy Agency, has sent us a message via video.